This Christmas, our theme, as you can see all around, there are tarpaulins there. We entitle that, A Child is Born. Taken from the reading this morning in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, from which also our choir will perform cantata with the title, A Song is Born. Right? So during, during, that's during our Christmas Eve. And we're just so excited about it. The bookmarks you can find in the insert of our tidings are for you to invite your friends to worship with us during Christmas cantata. So please invite them, right? Okay? Can you promise to bring in someone? <laughs> okay, the book of Isaiah is the first of the 17 prophetic books which we will study when we resume our walk through the Bible after Christmas season. That's going to be January. You know, as we know, when the people of God continues to sin and rebel against him, he sent the prophet Isaiah to warn them of their impending punishment if they would not turn away from their sin. The prophet described those days to be considered dark. There will be anguish and distress to grip the hearts of the people. It will be completely a terrifying national crisis. There will be helplessness because they will be living as a war-torn nation. They will be conquered by mighty nations like Assyria, Babylon, and then Persia. It will be indeed a dark moment for the whole of Israel, miserable and hopeless for the people, particularly in Judah. However, chapter 9 is an exciting promise. And this promise was given to comfort them in advance. In verse 1, it says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbles the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond Jordan. Because this is exactly where the Messiah or Jesus, 700 years after that prophecy, will concentrate his ministry. And in verse 2, it says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Because Jesus said that he is the light. And those who follow him will not walk in darkness. In verse 3 also, the prophecy said, You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people. Rejoice at the harvest. As warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. In verse 5, Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for fire. You know, indeed, it is, it is a great vision when armaments will be thrown away, when these things will no longer be used for battle. Because Jesus will not gather armies, but disciples of lowly stature. And Jesus will rule not in bloody or violent wars, but he will rule in humility. In verse 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And in verse 7 it says, Of the greatness of his government in peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from the time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now, based from this prophecy of Isaiah, there are four blessings that the people of God will receive from the promised Messiah. And why we need a Messiah? Because, number one, the Messiah will give them light. That's the first promise. That's the first benefit that we can get, we can receive from the Messiah. This is to address the darkness that the prophet Isaiah already proclaimed 
in the land of Judah as they're going to experience it. Isaiah here was warning that the people, before this prophecy ever happened, there is a comfort. There is a light that will be provided. Because it will be darkness to the land and to the people are in darkness. You know, darkness to Israel means a bleak future, a disaster condition under the oppression of other nation. Darkness is a symbol of sin, evil, and where God seems so distant and far away. However, this is also a universal problem that is not only Israel is experiencing. It is everywhere, the whole world. Darkness of sin, war, poverty, injustice. You can see them all around. It's not just in Israel. To us, darkness may be in many forms. In debt, mga utang, joblessness, sickness, broken relationship. You know, when you are in this situation, you don't know what to do. You need a counsel. You need advice or words to enlighten you. You need light to brighten your day. You need direction. So the Messiah that God promised to the Israelite is also the very Messiah we all need, the whole world. In verse 1, in the future, He will honor Galilee. The Messiah will perform many miracles here in this part of the land. He will teach the kingdom of God in Galilee. He will display God's power here in that place. And He will give hope to many. Number two, the promised Messiah will enlarge their nation. Due to the ravages of war, the population of God's people had been drastically diminished. But the promise was that their population would thrive, even be multiplied when the Messiah come, came. He will bring great joy to the people. And you know, this joy would flood their hearts as much as rejoicing over a great harvest or when they divided plunder among themselves. You know, if you're a farmer and there's an imminent harvest you're going to have, there is that joy in the heart. I can tell that to my, I can say that with all honesty and experience. Because my family is, my father and mother are farmers. Number three, deliver his people from oppression. Isaiah here was proclaiming that the Messiah will have the power to break any oppression or bandage weighing his people down. And he will deliver those who put their trust in this Messiah. And this is also a universal problem. You know, the devil is oppressive. In John chapter 10, verse 10, the enemy's motto is, He will come to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the enemy. You know, sin has a way of oppressing the sinner. When you commit sin, you're under that oppression. Guilt, the consequences, and all other sins that you commit afterwards. Even one, do you even wonder if, however hard you try to, you know, to, to come up with good product, with, you know, living in this world, but the enemy still wants to put you down. Kahit anong tiyaga mo sa trabaho, minsan kulang. You know, ever wonder why these things happen? It is the motto of the enemy to always steal, kill, and destroy you. But verse 5 will give us a picture of a delivered people where we don't have to fight the oppression of the devil because the Messiah is going to conquer that enemy. That is the picture of the promise of the Messiah. And number four, the promised Messiah will bring them peace. In verse 5 also, this is also a picture of great peace. We are all equipment and uniforms that are often covered with blood by the soldiers will be cast aside and burned. Never again will the military use them nor produce them. Peace will sweep the earth. This is also a universal problem because our world is torn with violence all around us. Guns, you know, all forms of violence. So the Messiah is not only the Messiah that the Israelites are needing, but the world, the Messiah that the world needs. He is our universal Messiah that you and I need. So verse, the verse that we've read, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, 
and the government will be on his shoulder, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You know, this will give us the nature of the Messiah, the God-man Messiah. So there are two natures of the promised Messiah. The first nature is that he is human. A child is born because he will be somebody who will go through a human process. Physiological stages from fetus, he will come out as a baby after nine months. He will come to earth as a child who will be born through the conception of a woman. However, the second nature this, or the second description was not taken to heart by the people of Israel. It says, a son is given. It will tell us that this Messiah is God, the deity. This child's being indicates that in some special way, God himself will send the child into the world. From heaven to the world, he is given. He is not someone from the world, but from above, given to the world. And this twofold nature of the Messiah is in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the incarnate deity. Now this event is staggering to human mind. How can the two fit together? Mary also had the same questions. But the angels assured her, saying in Luke 1 verse 37, the angel said, Mary, you have to believe, for with God, nothing is impossible. So after 700 years from that promise, Jesus did come. And today we are looking back upon this historic and pivotal event of the human history. On the night he was born, the angels appeared to the shepherds and the angels seemed to refer his words spoken by Isaiah. In Luke 2 verse 11, the angel said, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. He seemed to agree what prophet Isaiah already declared some 700 years ago. The prophet gave four names of the Messiah, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Today we will learn how the names of this Messiah would address the much needed reality of why he was sent into such a time, in the time where, when he was born. Why we should believe and hope that this Messiah, the child to be born in Jerusalem 700 years after his prophecy, is still the Messiah that you and I need today. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. The original word for Wonderful Counselor in Hebrew is Pili Yevetz. Now you read it as Pili Yevetz. Uh, Hebrews are read in a way that is parang matigas, no? Pabigla, yibitz, or y we read it as yaats, but it's yibitz. Meaning, pili, wonderful. And in the context of this verse, is beyond human understanding. In this passage, it literally means incomprehensible. In other words, a counselor is wonderful in a way that is boggling to the mind. Too wonderful for words. The next term is Yavitz. On the other hand, is to advise, to counsel. Now think about who that Jesus says our wonderful counselor is. He is there to advise, to, give, to guide, and to counsel us in an amazing and wonderful way. You know, when you counsel a person, you're giving that person a light. You explain what's the pros and cons of these options. You make, per, you make that person see the overall picture of the situation or circumstances. In other words, a counselor is expert. Expert to the level of a teacher. And this prophecy holds very true in the person of Jesus Christ. Because the Messiah that brings light to the world is the wonderful counselor. 
In John 1 verse 14, it says there, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. I'd like you to underline the word grace and truth. There's this combination in that verse. Truth is harsh, right? It brings judgment. When the light is on, everything will be exposed. The things you don't see in the darkness will be exposed to light. And sometimes it's harsh. But grace is there too. Grace to catch us, to embrace us, and to love us. Combined together in the person of Jesus Christ. Because He judges, He points your sin, and yet He offers solution. You know, Jesus has the harshest words to the Pharisees who are proud, but He has the gentlest word for the weak and the sinner. He is wonderful counselor because he is able to bring out light and expose the sin of this world and in the same time offering solution to those who are willing to receive him. That is our wonderful counselor. And in bringing light to the world, Jesus, after teaching the Beatitudes and about the light of this world, he says in Matthew chapter 5, 16 to 17. Can we read together? In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus gives light to the world by exposing us to our sins. And that is exactly what we need for a counselor to give us an honest picture of who we are. In the next verse, Jesus will give us the real score of what it means to sin. In chapter 5, verse 27 to 28, he said, You have heard that it was said, Do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his, in his heart. That is our real score. An advisor would give you light. This is you. You are a sinner. You don't have to commit adultery in order for you to be punished by your own eyes. By looking at the woman lustfully, you have already sinned. He is bringing light to the condition of this earth. 21 to 22, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. This is wonderful counselor because he will bring us to the fact that we are helpless. Small sin is no different from big sin. They have the same punishment. In other words, we cannot obey the law and be pronounced righteous through the law. In Romans 3.22, this righteousness from God comes through the faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. Another reason why Jesus is wonderful counselor is that he teaches wisdom that defies conventional wisdom of this world. Things that are counterintuitive to the human mind or contrary to common sense. In Matthew chapter 5, he told us to rejoice and be glad in persecution. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. How can you rejoice and be glad in persecution? In the world's point of view, this is defeat. You are persecuted. But Jesus tells us that beyond persecution is blessedness and reward. So Jesus tells us to see something that most people cannot see. He also teaches us to love your enemy. Imagine, you are going to love your enemy? This is not conventional. He said, do good to those who hate you. And these are not conventional wisdom. Luke 17 verse 33, whoever tries to keep his life will lose it and whoever loses his life will preserve it. And then another one, if you want to have much, give. This is counterintuitive. If you give, maubusan ka, right? But somehow in the mathematics of Jesus, it's different. The more you give, the more you are blessed. 
And if you want to be glorified, you have to be humble. You have to be the last in order for you to be first. Wonderful counselor. This is amazing, although however weird sometimes and against conventional wisdom. But those who have tried his formula can attest to its truthfulness and power. Right? Colossians 2, verse 3. In Jesus Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Nasa kanya ang mga sekreto. That if you disobey Him, you will experience the benefit of listening to this wonderful counselor. But most importantly, Jesus is our wonderful counselor, is able to empathize with us. If you go to a counselor or advisor or psychologist or psychiatrist, they can only give their opinion. But they may not be able to empathize with you. In pastoral counseling, we have this term, transference. And we were taught to avoid them. When we counsel, we just have to listen, but we have to have this art of not being able to transfer the emotion from your counselee because that will be, um, uh, you will have trouble after that. That's what we call, uh, because emotions are actually transferable. But isn't it exactly what we need? That our emotions can be transferred to someone else so that we can share to them our burden and our burden will become light. Jesus, the promised Messiah, who is wonderful counselor, is opening himself to this transference because he said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all of you who are heavy laden, so I can get your emotion and you will, I will give you rest. Jesus put himself in that position of emotional transference so he can carry our load and we can find rest. You can't do that to any counselor on this earth. A human counselor may only have too much to bear. But Jesus is wonderful. He always knows what we are going through and he always knows the right course of action. In Hebrews 4, 4 verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are yet without sin. Jesus is the God-man counselor who is able to understand our humanity. He is just what the world needs. He is just what you and I need. Are you in darkness today? Are you in trouble? Are you in, in an emotional ups and down? Do you need someone you can talk to? Someone who is able to understand every bit of your feelings or your emotions to confront you honestly but also can provide you with comfort and rest? Jesus is the answer. He is our wonderful counselor. And He still invites you to confide to Him because He loves you and is very much interested in you. His name will also be called Mighty God. When Israel was delivered from the hands of the Egyptians a long time ago, every one of them was convinced that it is through the mighty acts of God that they were able to escape um, the Pharaoh. Exodus 6, verse 6, it says, Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you under, uh, sorry, bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. What are those mighty acts? He divided the sea. He provided them food and water for 40 years. He led them to win in battles and occupy the promised land. He literally saved them from his through his power with an outstretched arm. And now that they are about to be handed over to their enemies because of their disobedience, God reminded them that a Messiah will be born to be called Mighty God. The same Mighty God who rescued you before I will give to you. And this is your Messiah. Surely their number will diminish because some of them will be, will be killed in the battles. But this Messiah to be born was promised to enlarge their nation. To make an increase 
in their population and he will bring great joy to the people. How is this possible? You know, I, I researched and the population of Israel in 1960 was only about 2 million. Presently, today in 2016, their population reached 8.5 million, making them 0.1% of the world's population against the whole world's population, which is 7.5 billion. So only 0.1%. Now, that's not impressive if you're looking at enlarging your nation. But what is the prophecy saying here is not just the nation of Israel, but the nation of believers. And this is exactly in connection to the promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis 15 verse 5. He says, look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And later, after that, John the Baptist, as he was baptizing, he said in Luke 3 verse 8, I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. We have Abraham as our... Okay, I'll read. Produce truth in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say yourself, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children of Abraham. In other words, God can be... The children of God cannot be dependent on the bloodline of the Jewish people. Today in 2010, there are already 2.2 billion Christians all over the world, making it 31% of the world population. Ang layo po sa 0.1% na population ng Hudyo against the 2.2 billion na population ng believers. In other words, you are counted in that population because you are a believer. What makes this title, Mighty God, be perfect for the Messiah? is because through Him, many will be brought to salvation. What used to be understood as salvation to Israel is actually for the whole world. Jesus said to His disciples before He died in John 12, Now is the time for judgment in this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. This is great and good news. Because this mighty God who worked wonders for Israel in their history to save them from their enemy is making a spectacle in the cross and making a display when he is lifted up in the cross so that all those who will believe in this person who will die on that cross will be brought to him. You know, this is more powerful than any earthly victories in the battle. Why? And this is a thousand times better than conquering a nation. You know, dividing a sea is not hard to do for God. Supplying them food for 40 years is so easy. Conquering all nations is just a breath before the Lord. No, the question is not that power. But the question is to put your name in the book of life. It caused the death of God. You see the power there? He can just say words, oh, see, divide. Food, feed my people. But to put one name into heaven, that God has to die. And yet, he conquered death because he is the mighty God. When you believe in Jesus Christ, your name is li listed in that book of life. Isn't it reason for rejoicing? Is there anything that God is not able to do? The prophecy that says, they rejoice because you as people re rejoicing at harvest is coming true. The mighty act of God made them rejoice. Although a lot of people couldn't see that being hung on the tree is power and not defeat. Jesus would always talk about harvest as a figurative of salvation. In Luke chapter 10 verse 2, he told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. What robbed you joy in your life today? Is your life in chaos? Is your life out of control? 
Jesus, our Messiah, is the mighty God who is able to deliver you just like He delivered the nation of Israel. But more than delivering you from any circumstances, Jesus is able to deliver you to the most, from the most terrible event in the universe that will happen in the future, the judgment before the throne of God, if your name is not listed there. Our song, Joy to the World, the Lord is Come, is indeed rightful song. Because Jesus' coming is not just for the tiny nation of Israel, but His coming is for the whole world. And He will certainly bring great joy to the whole world. So the Messiah's coming as wonderful counselor and mighty God is for us to look at Jesus, not with a helpless, not in a helpless state as a baby, but that we look at Him with greater power and greater wisdom for all our needs. For the glory of God. Next week, we will talk about how this Messiah is called the Everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. So let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you indeed for sending the Messiah to us. He is the Savior that we need, Lord. Thank you for his great power, but displayed in humility. You sent him, Lord, <clears throat> so that we can all glorify you in heaven. <clears throat> when we will be saved, when all the people come to him, and we will be led to that light, all multitude of people, will come rejoicing <clears throat> because you are worthy of the praises of all the people. So at, in this season that we are celebrating your coming, humble us, Lord, and teach us the virtues that you have revealed to us through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Help us to be humble to come to you and to accept that we are miserable and we have no direction apart from your counsel and help us also to lift up our troubled lives and to surrender them to the power of the almighty God thank you God thank you Jesus for coming to earth so we can celebrate our salvation. <clears throat> May your name continue to be glorified in our lives, O Lord, and in the life of your church, and in the whole world. Thank you. Amen and amen.